This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. This is the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles. G Money, we start with Devontae Parker. And I want to go question by question here, right? So let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's look at this analytically. Let's look at this from every aspect. And we start with the deal itself. The Patriots trade a future third round pick. They get Devontae Parker, a fifth round pick in return. Uh, your thoughts on the deal parameters and what the Patriots gave up here? Yeah, I thought. Um... You know, look, basically what the Patriots gave up a future third, so next year's third, is basically the equivalent of a fourth-round pick this year. Um, And they get a fifth back this year. I mean, really, you're talking about – I mean, it's – they really got them for free almost. I mean, it's there's not a huge difference. And I think when you talk about that compensation plus that – Devontae Parker is under contract for two more years at a very manageable salary at like $6 million a year. Uh, To me, it was a number one. It was a, it was a no brainer for the Patriots. I mean, I do kind of question, and this is one question I didn't put down. I don't think, uh, you know, why the dolphins would do this. Why, why would they, you know, basically allow the Patriots to get a starting caliber receiver. And we can debate on how good he is, but he, you know, he's a starting caliber receiver um, in your division for not much compensation. And it's, it's not like you're saving a ton of money if you're the dolphins. Um, So I think that uh, you put all those aspects together. I mean, I, I like the deal overall for the Patriots, just the deal itself. It's kind of a no brainer. Uh, for me, I question it from a Dolphins perspective on exactly, you know, what are they doing? What's the, what's the, what's the aim here? And we'll probably get into that as we talk about Parker, uh, the player, but yeah, I think it's a good deal for the Patriots. Yeah, I'm fine with it. I mean, I like the deal. I I like it a lot just from the value standpoint. Again, you're not giving up much. People say, Oh, a third round pick, like Greg mentioned, the NFL handles this in, in, in a different way. If you give up a third round pick next year, it's really, you know, giving up like a fourth round pick this year. Right. And when you look at a second round pick, you kind of just jump the next round. So they didn't give up a ton. They have a compensatory pick now, whether or not they'll get that compensatory pick depends on what they do in free agency next year, but they didn't give up much given that they're getting a fifth round pick back. And, and people might say, Oh, fifth round pick. I actually think that fifth round pick is going to help the Patriots. Number one, it doesn't give them this gigantic gap in the draft. And number two, we talk about their need for interior offensive linemen. You look back in the last several years, the Patriots and other teams have been able to find good starting guards in the NFL at the NFL level from the third, fifth, sixth round. So Mm -hmm. that could be a, a pick where they can earmark that interior offensive lineman. And as far as the contract, I mean, come on, he's going to make about $6 million the next two years. You saw what Stefan Diggs got this morning, 70 million guaranteed. And I'm not telling you he's Diggs, but you look at these huge contracts in the wide receiver market being like bananas to get a guy who I think is at least a solid number two for you for $6 million the next couple of years without giving up a ton. I think it makes a lot of sense for the Patriots. Greg, Let's get into the scouting report. I know you wrote about Parker this week. I know that you looked at the film. What do you see from from Parker, and and what would you tell people as the scouting report? What's the book on Devontae Parker as he becomes a Patriot? Okay, number one, um, you know, and look, we've seen Parker twice a year um, since 2015 with the Dolphins. So some people are familiar with him, but sometimes it's – you get confused, like, is it Jarvis Landry or Devontae Parker? And it's, like, hard to differentiate some of these guys down in Miami. And so, you know, I watched all of his 2021 film. And the number one thing I think people need to understand is this is not a game-breaker type of guy. You know, if he, he was the 14th overall pick in 2015, normally when you get a pick that high, you're like, all right, this is a guy who's a playmaker. He He's... He's not that. I mean, he basically what people should think of is sort of a skinnier, not as physically strong, but a much better receiver than Nikhil Harry. They're very similar in that they are boundary guys. They, uh, in theory, of course, when we're talking about Nikhil Harry, but, you know, 
body control guys, catch a lot of back shoulders, really good on contested catches, uh, pretty good with the ball in his hand. I like Parker. Um, he seems to take another level once, and people can remember some of those slants that two has hit the past couple of years on the Patriots sort of late in the game to clinch games where the Patriots had all this cushion. That was Dante uh, Devontae Parker a couple times. And he's the type of guy who can take – he runs a lot of those slants like that where, you know, he's a bigger body, he's six foot three. He's about 200 pounds. He ran four, four, five coming out. He's probably not that now. He's probably more like four, five, maybe, you know, four, four, uh, excuse me, four, five, five. Uh, but, you know, he catches a ball and I think he has very good awareness. Once he gets the ball in his hands, he has the ability to break a tackle because he's a bigger guy. Uh, not as thick as Nikhil Harry, but still a bigger guy. Guy, You see guys bounce off his legs at times and he can, you know, he can get another 20 yards that way. If you think that he is just going to be on the boundary and, you know, dust some cornerback off the wide receiver and catch a 70 yard touchdown pass, that's not really his game. And, you know, when we get into sort of uh, the fit with the Patriots, I think I think that context is important about what they might do. What do they do about Nelson Aguilar? I think that, you know, basically he's a Harry replacement. Hasn't worked out with Harry. They like that type of guy. He's the type of guy, Nick, that when he's covered, he's still open. In that it's a good type of guy for Mac right. Jones in that, you know, Mac Jones can say, all right, well, this cover, I like this matchup. I think Devontae Parker in a 50-50 ball is going to win this battle, and he can go to him in a big spot. So I think there is definite value there. He might not, you know, keep defensive coordinators awake at night, but he certainly has value. And at $6 million a year, I think you see – you know, Robbie Anderson was a lot higher price. I think Robbie Anderson's a better player, more big play potential. But in terms of bang for your buck, you can get a lot with Devontae Parker. He gives Mac Jones an out. Somebody that Mac can believe in and trust. If, like you said, Greg, if the guy's covered, Mac can still throw it to him. He's very good at contested catches, as you've mentioned. If you look at it statistically since like 2019, he's right at the top of the heap. And that's even more, I think to me, that's even more impressive. The fact that he is near the top of the mountain, if not on the top of the mountain, when it comes to contested catches in the last few years, given that he hasn't played a ton, like he hasn't played 16 games a year. He hasn't played 17 games last year, which we'll get into because I think the biggest question about him is his health. But even when he hasn't been healthy, that should tell you how often Miami threw the football and, and believed in him and trusted in his ability to come down at the high point of the catch and win that battle. So I think he's an out from Mac. And when you look at what the Patriots have tried to do, this makes a ton of sense, doesn't it? I mean, what they've tried to go out and get Nikhil Harry, it didn't work out. Uh, they were interested in Allen Robinson. They could not, you know, they didn't want to pay him the money or he wanted to go to LA, whatever happened there. Mm -hmm. They were looking, they've been looking for the last few years for this bigger, boundary receiver who might not be you know the most speedy guy in the world but when you when you throw it up he can go and get it and when you're in the red zone he's that kind of bigger bodied target and they got parker and i think for the value it makes just so much sense when you look at this offense nick one more thing about this I, with one you. more thing i forgot sure. on parker that i wanted to bring up um you know and you brought up his injuries there there's obviously some red flags some of the things I didn't like, and it, if I'm the Patriots wide receivers coach, whether that's Troy Brown or Joe Judge or whoever it is, the number one thing I'm working on Parker on is his, his, his route running at the top of his route. Meaning, you know, if he's, if he's running a 20-yard in cut, you know, he's running straight down the field for 20 yards, then all of a sudden he's breaking across. And if pe people might remember this play, and I and – I, broke down this play on BSJ. He had an in cut against JC Jackson last year where JC Jackson eventually came in and broke up the play. Now look, two is his quarterback. I mean, actually I thought that throw was pretty good, but what happens on that route is Devonte Parker gets to the top of the route. And instead of coming down straight down the 39 yard line across the field, which would gain you a couple extra yards of space, um, 
Parker sort of faded his route almost to like the 35 yard line. And that allowed JC Jackson the opportunity uh, to you know, the time and also the avenue to undercut the route and get a piece of the ball and break up that play. If D- Devontae Parker, because he's not the fastest guy in the world, he's more of a long strider type of guy, you know, he needs to, he's not going to run away from anybody. He's not going to outquick anybody. But if he's more precise with his route running, then all of a sudden you gain a couple extra yards and now you're a lot more productive. And to me, I see that sort of upside with Parker that, you know, he looks like a smart receiver on film. Um, He's talented. He does catch 50-50 balls very well, which is very important to the Patriots. But if he could just be a little bit more precise in his route running, I think he can be that much better. And, And if I'm Troy Brown, and hopefully he's the Patriots wide receivers coach, then that's job one with Devontae Parker, and I think he can go to another level if he can master that. Yeah, can they coach him up? And, and, and quarterback is also a question, which we'll get into the year that Parker had in 2019 with Ryan Fitzpatrick. When I look at this overall, Greg, and, and I want to look at the parts now that the Patriots have at receiver, because people might say, oh, who does he replace? What does he do? As we've mentioned, I think it's obvious his fit is that at that X receiver position. That's who he's going to be. What I really like about this trade and in, in this idea and this philosophy, and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about last week with the defensive secondary and, and, and the Patriots being able to move different guys in different spots and, and being able to game plan for certain teams and mix and match and, and have that versatility. You know, the Parker move now, it, it opens up these other guys. Now you can slide Aguilar into the slot and he can run different routes, and and he could be that explosive guy out of the slot position, and he can get downfield. You have the Kendrick Bourne kind of of jack-of-all trades where you can move him around. Now you've got that solid boundary, bigger receiver that you've been looking for. You have Jonu Smith, who I think we both believe is going to be used in different ways this season, And, and I think he will have more impact. Is he going to be great? Jury's still out, but I think he'll have more impact than last year, and you've got Hunter Henry along with the back, so you know, you might not have that number one stud like Tyreek Hill or Devontae Adams, and everybody's given up tons of picks and tons of money to these guys. But when you look at the overall core and the overall offense, there's not a name that gets you all crazy and, you know, doing jumping jacks. But football wise, I think a lot of this makes sense. And I think the Patriots, they're going to look at Aguilar and say, he's going to be better now because we're going to utilize him better because we've got Devontae Parker born with another year in the offense, we're going to be able to use his kind of gadgetry a little bit and and utilize him more. John O. Smith, let's get rid of the traditional fullback and let's use him in different ways. And I'm kind of excited and interested in what this coaching staff does. And we've had our questions about the offensive side of the ball and the coaching staff, and there should be questions, but I am excited and interested what this offense looks like and what shape it's going to take as these guys all come together and try to figure it out. Yeah, sort of the big thing for me watching Parker on film is, and and look, the, this can change, and I think a lot of it could change on the draft. But I think, I think Aguilar still has a place here. Now, he's yep. got a very high cap number this year, so if the Patriots all of a sudden, you know, say they take Mechie uh, from Alabama or something in the second round, or you know, trade down and you know, get a wide receiver and they get to camp and they're like, this guy's good. Then Aguilar becomes expendable um, because of the cost. But, you know, as of right now, as of today, I think Aguilar has a place on this team. And I think, you know, you and I have talked about it before that I think that, and, and I don't blame the Patriots for taking this approach. I like it. And we talked about it when they signed all those free agents last year. And I'm a little bit worried how much it's going to mesh in year one. It's normally better in year two. And I think that, you know, a guy like Aguilar stands a chance to be, you know, much better. I do think the arrival of Devontae Parker, you know, helps Aguilar get some better matchups and things like that. But to me, Aguilar is still the outside speed element on this team as of right now. You know, they, that might change with the draft. And I think, like you said, Kendrick Bourne is the more gadgety, quick sort of, uh, sort of guy, but to me, I think, I think as of right now, I think Parker and Aguilar are almost your. If you go with two wide receivers, they're almost your quote unquote starting receivers because they're two different receivers. Aguilar is more of a deep guy. Devontae Parker is more of a power forward type of guy. And then all of a sudden, you get Bourne and Myers into the mix, 
And, um, you know, so I like, I, I agree with you. I like their mix. I still, I still think Aguilar has a place here. I think that they'll be able to move him around a little bit more to sort of take advantage of matchups and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, I think that, I, I like the group that they have. They're all different, and it'll be interesting to see if they do anything in the draft to sort of uh, accentuate that. Yeah, and of course, you know, I didn't forget about Jacoby Myers. He's he's out there as well. He has proven himself as kind of a big-bodied slot receiver somewhat, and I think when you have those four guys, if they can stay healthy, it is an interesting mix. You just brought up the draft. Greg, if you're Bill Belichick and you're looking at this roster right now and you're thinking, what are we going to do come draft night and draft weekend? Are you done at the receiver position? Uh, I thought so, Nick, until I was reading um, at Boston Sports Journal, our draft guy, Kevin Field, did his, uh, we just posted a little while ago, his um, sort of wide receiver um, scouting report. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's chock full of, he goes through, uh, potential first rounders, and then also Patriots fit by round. And what what really stood out to me, and I I guess I really didn't take note of it until I saw it on paper, is that the Patriots, even with Devontae Parker, and look, we all know this could change over time, but right now they don't have one receiver on the roster that's signed through the twenty twenty uh, signed beyond twenty twenty three. Yep. I mean, when you're talking about you have Mac Jones, you know he's going into his second year. You'd love to have some sort of guy, uh, preferably for me, it's a speedy, quick slot receiver that you say, all right, Mac, here's your guy for the next five to 10 years. And so to me, just looking at the depth chart, to me, it screams out that they need some sort of potential starter at receiver. I don't care what position it is um, out of this draft. I mean, I don't think it's it's not certainly not mandatory now. Um, and maybe the Patriots, you know, they've had some success with undrafted free agents and we know how deep the receiver class is. So you could get a good developmental guy, uh, late in the draft or undrafted free agency. But to me, I still think you, you know, my dream, everybody who listens to this podcast knows my dream, a speedy slot receiver that Matt can go to and can get open your Julian Edelman, Wes Welker type of guy, uh, and uh, I, to me, I think wide receiver is still on the list. I agree with you. I think when you look contractually, you hit the nail on the head. Aguilar, Myers, they're likely gone after this year. Myers, you know, he's proven himself. He, he's going to probably price him out of the Patriots. Maybe not, but. Uh, you know he's going to take some cut rate team friendly deal. You know he is. You know that's, that's coming in like a week. I'm just he telling could. you. He could. But, you know, when you look at it right now and all we can go off of is the information that we have at right. our fingertips. I mean, again, you hit the nail on the head. Aguilar, Myers, they're done after this year. Parker has two years left. You know, you look at Bourne. Bourne is gone pretty soon. So I do think you have to get younger at that position. And I do think you have to draft somebody in this year's draft. Is that the second round, third round, fifth round? I don't know. I think somebody like John Mechie makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And, and, and when you look at what the Patriots have done here, they've bought themselves some time. And yeah. when we talk about the wide receiver development and the lack thereof, you know, some of it is they haven't drafted a lot of guys in premier positions, you know, of the draft and the slots, you know, for, mm-hmm. for guys like wide receivers. When you look at first round pick, of course, Harry was a first round pick, didn't work out. But a lot of their picks have been mid round, late round picks you know, undrafted free agents at that position. They haven't invested nearly as much as other teams draft capital wise in the wide receiver position. And what they're doing, I think is now you've got two bites of at the apple, right? Like, so you've got, you've got yourself set up for this year. If you draft somebody like Mechie, who's coming off of, I believe an ACL. Yeah. Or Jamison Williams. Or Jamison Williams. If you draft somebody who's coming off of an injury and, and one of the biggest criticisms of this year's wide receiver draft class is that they've been hurt. There's a lot of guys that have been dinged up some serious injuries. You mentioned, you know, Jamison and, and of course, Mechie with the ACLs um, Pickens is another guy who's been banged up. There's a lot of good receiving talent. I don't know if they're all going to be number ones, but they're banged up. So what this does is it allows the Patriots, let's say they like Mechie. But they, they say to themselves, we don't want to rush him back. We, we don't want to, you know, lack any kind of development. 
we can we can draft somebody like Mechie. We deal Nikhil Harry for a fifth round pick or a sixth round, whatever they do. We bring Mechie in, and now we can cultivate him. We can grow him within the system. And by next year, now he's popping. And then you also have next year's draft that you can also address the wide receiver position if you feel the need to. So I think it keeps their options open. And Greg, you've you've done a really good job of addressing this in the past about Belichick and how, you know, the first 15, 16 years of his tenure in New England, he was always ahead. He was always ahead. He always had contingencies. He always knew what was happening in the future and, and, and to try to be ahead of the curve. And I think he's doing that with receiver, especially especially if they draft a receiver or two over the next year or two, he's getting ahead of this and he's giving himself and his staff some time to truly develop the young receiver that they bring in and they don't just throw him into the fire. So I think they're absolutely open uh, to, to looking at drafting a receiver. Let's look at 2019, Greg Devontae Parker, his best season as an NFL receiver. He had Ryan Fitzpatrick that year. Um, he hasn't been necessarily great with Tua. What do you make of all of that? How much is on Parker? How much is on the quarterback situation? And one more thing I'll throw in there that people might not be keenly aware of is not only you look at the quarterback, but you look at the offensive coordinator position. And, and I've made this joke before. I'll make it again. You know, when Brian Flores was head coach in Miami, he changed OCs like he changed his underwear. He went through Chad O'Shea. Then he went to Chan Gailey. Then he went to the two offensive coordinator system. It was always all over the place. So when you look at Parker and you assess him, how much of that other stuff do you think affected him and maybe impacted his production? Well, I'll say this. I think that, um, you know, when I evaluate receivers, I'm not looking at, um, you know, production and things like that. I'm looking at like, you know, can he get open? Can he catch contested passes? How does he do after the catch? How what's his route running like? And that does that doesn't really it's not really affected by who the quarterback is. So I think, you know, his assessment, if he was coming off 2019, I wouldn't say anything different about Devontae Parker. I mean, I do think he's a little slower. I mean, he's 29 with a lot of soft tissue injuries. And, you know, that was one of the concerns. I, you know, I have a pretty good source with the Dolphins and I asked him uh, about Parker and he was, you know, he was he he had a lot of praise for Parker, but you know the soft t- tissue injury stuff is real with him, and I don't think he's quite as explosive as he used to be. The biggest thing I'll say about 2019 is, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick is a guy who he just slings it. He doesn't care whether you're open. He's confident that he can throw you open, that you'll make a play. Whereas Tua will be a lot more, um, you know, a lot more half field reads, a lot more conservative. I don't want to make a mistake, even though he does make mistakes. And I just think, and look, I would say Mac Jones is somewhere in between Ryan Fitzpatrick and Tua in terms of, you know, his confidence, which I think is going to grow in terms of, you know, fitting balls into spots and and really pushing the envelope. Early in the season, he was a lot more conservative as a rookie. You figured that would be the case. He got a little bit more aggressive and more comfortable as the season went along as Josh McDaniels brought him along. Um, I, I think that... You know, I wouldn't look at 2019 and say, you know, Devontae Parker's a 1,200-yard receiver, nine touchdowns every year. I would just say that if the more aggressive Mac is, and I think he will grow in that area, then I think Parker will be able to deliver for Mac Jones and be productive. Let's jump to the draft where, what, let me see, I think three weeks away from tomorrow, we've got the NFL draft. Uh, Greg, when you look at the Patriots roster, which three positions uh, must the Patriots draft and get a potential starter? Well, you know, when you look at the three positions that you want to stick a pin in, so to speak, if you're the Patriots and you say, we, we've got to get a starter down the road at that position. What positions are we talking? Number one for me, and I know it's not sexy and people will make fun of me because they, they love to when it comes to this, but to me, it's a run stuffer inside, like a bona fide, got to put two guys on him, got to take up blockers. He's not going to get moved, uh, that sort of guy. Because even even if you think, you know, give give him, give Devon Godchow the year two or year one pass that we're giving Nelson Aguilar and Johnny Smith, even if you do that, he's in a contract year. And... There's nothing beyond that. I mean, the only other real interior guys that they have 
are uh, Ekawale and Bill Murray. That's, you know, and Bill Murray's a nice try-hard guy, but he's undersized, and Ekawale's okay, but that's that's literally all they have at nose tackle. I mean, Lawrence Guy is, I, I look at him as more of an end, and that's where he's played here. Or, you know, if you go to a 4-3, I don't want to get into that because it really doesn't matter anymore. You need to stop the run at least on first down in the league now. And I just don't think the Patriots had the personnel. I'm not high on Godchow. He could be better in year two. I'm not discounting that. I'm just going off of what I saw in year one. He should have had an easier time transitioning than anybody because he was in Miami with Brian Flores playing the exact same spot. He played it well. He comes here. No, tra- It shouldn't have been any transition for him, and he, and he underwhelmed largely last year. To me, you know, if if a guy like if they have a chance to get a guy like Jordan Davis from from Georgia at number twenty one, and he's there, I'm running up to the podium and I'm taking him because you put his six six three hundred and forty pound you know bench press eight thousand pounds guy <laughs> right in the middle of that defense. The Patriots are a hell of a lot better the next day. So to me, number one is uh, a run stuffer nose tackle. Me as cornerback, uh, I still think they need a legit man cornerback who can play press coverage, even if they're going to a little bit more zone. I'm not the biggest fan of Jalen Mills, as you know. You might be able to hide him at, at the number two position with, with a really good number one. Uh, Malcolm Butler is, what, 32 years old. Terrence Mitchell is, is pretty much, you know, your, your solid NFL veteran. They need to get younger at cornerback and they need to get somebody who can play man coverage. I'm not, you don't necessarily need a lockdown top five corner, but I really think they have to show some urgency getting young at that position because the guys right now on the roster, a lot of questions for me. And so I'd like to see them invest in a nice, young, legit man cover corner. Uh, but hey, look, I, I also, I hear you. I hear you about Jordan Davis and I don't necessarily disagree with your Jordan Davis take. I mean, if you, if you're looking at, let's say Elam versus Davis at 21, I would go with the higher ceiling, more potential guy. And I would pick Davis. And I would hope that one of the corners that would fall to me in the second round would be my man corner of the future. Uh, Because Davis, I think, I mean, look, if you could just imagine Christian Barmore, with Jordan Davis and how much of a disaster that would be for opposing offensive lines. It makes me straight up giddy. They, they'd wreck Anthony people. Up. They wouldn't have teams would not be able to handle it inside. Yep. I mean, they, they, and we always talk about it, but it's so true. If you can get that pressure mm-hmm. up the middle and th- that is what destroys a quarterback. Um, so I think if you could get Davis at 21, I would have absolutely no problem with that pick. Uh, your second position you're looking at, Greg. Offensive tackle, you know, Isaiah wins in his fifth year option year. Trent Brown is here for, you know, who knows how long, Um, you know, if he doesn't play more than, you know, a half a season, he could be gone after this year. They didn't, you know, give him that much money. They didn't guarantee him that much money. Uh, You know, they don't, I mean, but the big thing is I think they need to try to get a guy who's a left tackle for, for the future and either, you know, for the first year as a rookie starts at guard um, or you move win inside the guard and play this kid. Uh, I'm getting at least I'm getting, you know, an offensive tackle with starter upside relatively early in the draft, because to me, that's a, it's a huge need. I think, I think both tackle spots beyond this year are big question marks. We once agree. uh, You know, we once again, agree, Mr. Bedard, because I think when you look at offensive tackle, like, I mean, you said everything I could say. Brown and Win, to me, major question marks for the long term. And, and if you could get a staple, if you could get a guy who's there for the next eight to ten years, and you could rely on, then you could figure it out with Win. And if Brown has a good season, great. You could you could keep Brown, and everything's fine. Uh, but right now, it's a little too unknown, a little too unpredictable, and I'm not super confident in, in Brown being able to stay healthy. And I'm not super confident after win season a year ago. So I think getting that young tackle would make a ton of sense. Uh, your third position. Yeah, I mean, you you made me reconsider. I mean, cornerback is definitely on the list, and it should definitely be considered. So I'm I'm going to split cornerback and also wide receiver here. Um, you know, there's sort of a tie for me because we talked about the future 
There's no one signed beyond 2023 at receiver. You'd love to get a talented young guy that you can pair with Mac Jones and their, you know, Batman and Robin for the next 10 years uh, at receiver. You would love to get that guy in this draft, but if it doesn't work out, you know, okay, but you know, I'm fine with a cornerback. Cause like you said, cornerback is in the same sort of position. You don't know what you're going to get. You don't know whether you have a matchup guy in terms of man coverage in that unit. You'd like that because you're going to have to win on third, you know, third and 12 big game playoff game, or to get into the playoffs, you're going to have to man up and bring pressure at certain times. Who's going to, who's going to do that? Who's going to provide a stop for you? It's tough to see anybody right now, and you need to get somebody in the pipeline that can do that for you. Yeah, wide receiver is my third, so we're all pretty much on the same page. Let's jump to uh, the BostonSportsJournal.com member question of the day. Check them out over at BSJ, $39.99 on the annual plan, of course. Not only do you get top-notch analysis of all the Boston pro sports, and look, it's a great time, right? The Bruins marching towards the playoffs. Celtics are in the playoffs. Red Sox season starting. There's a lot happening right now. The offseason with football. we got the draft coming up. We still have a lot of free agents out there. Akeem Hicks, Trey Flowers, uh, Honey Badger. People are still out there. Things can happen. Uh, aside from all of that good information that you can get, you also get with a membership. A ton of video analysis that Bedard does on the coaches' film, and Bedard wrote about Devontae Parker this week and broke down some film. Mac uh, Davis direct- next. Ooh, there you go. How, how about that? And uh, you got direct access to him in weekly chats as well. Uh, Jackie Treehorn has a question. Greg, is there a reason to think Joe Judge will be coaching wide receivers as opposed to Troy Brown? So this was a question that came from my Devontae Parker breakdown, and I talked about, you know, the number one job for the wide receiver coach, and I mentioned Joe Judge, and I wasn't – I wanted to answer this question just because I wasn't really thinking. I mean, I was more thinking about Parker. In my mind, I'm like, Joe Judge was a wide receivers coach last time he was here. Um, but, you know, from what we know, the pieces that we know, it's, it's you know, Joe Judge is probably going to coach quarterbacks or be involved with the quarterbacks. He might be – from what I hear, Nick – from the owners' meetings, and we didn't talk about this last week. From what I heard, uh, the scuttlebutt is Joe Judge is going to be the pass game coordinator, and Matt Patricia is going to be the run game coordinator. Offensive line, run game coordinator. Joe Judge is going to be either quarterbacks or wide receivers slash pass game coordinator. So I just wanted to make that uh, point to everybody and get that out there. Very interesting. Joe Judge, pass game coordinator, Patricia, run game coordinator. I don't know how I feel about that. If somebody told you that 10 years ago, or they say six or seven years ago, they're going to be like, in 2023, you're going to have a second, second year, first round quarterback. And guess what? Matt Patricia is going to be the run game coordinator. and Joe Judge is going to be the pass game coordinator. You'd be like, what? Depending on what happens over the next week, I I think next week, uh, let's just kind of keep this in mind. We, I, I think drilling down on the offensive staff and Mac Jones, and I know Dan Orlovsky, we don't have enough time to get to it right. today, but Dan Orlovsky talked about, you know, how it's, it's his, it's his biggest worry in the NFL. His biggest concern this year is who is surrounding Mac Jones. And um, I'll just say this. There have been quarterbacks in the past that have had to go through a lot of different change and have still been able to, to remain successful and, and take a step forward. Now, is Mac going to be one of those guys? I don't know. You know, that's, that's more the anomaly. You would like to have a coaching staff and consistency and play calling and all of that stuff for a young quarterback. I, I 100% agree with Dan about that. But, you know, Justin Herbert had a lot of change in his first couple of years, and he seemed to do okay. So I, I think, you know, if, if Mac is as smart as we give him credit for, uh, and, and they improve around him and, and utilize their talent better, then I, I think he'll be fine. Oh, Ben, uh, Nick, real quick, um, sure. that reminds me. Uh, one thing I wanted to clean up a little bit from last week, or uh, yeah, I think it was last week, and we talked about, and I didn't go back and listen to it, but remember when I br- brought up what's the craziest rumor I heard at the league meetings? Uh, and yeah, Bill I O'Brien. think I thought that I couched it as this is a crazy rumor. I don't think I really believe it. Like, I think we couched it that way, but uh, let's just say um, Bill O'Brien will not be succeeding Nick Saban at Alabama. <laughs> and I think we brought this up that Nick, that Nick Saban's probably going to coach till he's like 90. 
Um, the guy's 70 years old, but he's like, he's got the body of a 50 year old. Like that's not on the table again. That's, uh, you know, it, it was a crazy rumor. I just want to make that clear before Zoe and Beetle run wild with it even more, but I just <laughs> wanted to make that clear that it was a, it was a, it was a very crazy rumor. See what you started. He's Greg. <laughs> Bedard, G Money, the man. Uh, I am Nick Cattles, Greg Bedard, Patriots Podcast with Nick Cattles. Uh, everybody have a good weekend. We mean it. Be good. Be safe. Be well. We'll talk to you next week.